a motion and second all those in favor to advance unanimous approval next we'll have public comments is there anyone out there that um has anything on their mind that they would like to address this board i'm certainly welcome to do so now seeing no one move we're going to utilize this time you know there's been a lot of talk about splashing the borough why is it open why was it closed and we're going to use this time to call on our interim recreation director and uh and justin if i don't know how y'all want to handle this if both of you want to go up there at one time and tag team you certainly can while y'all are going up there i'm going to remind the commissioners to do one thing pull your mics closer as close to you as you can so that um, those in the audience could, could hear us Morning, Jay, I'm the director. When I came early October, I didn't have any black hair. Almost <laughs> this chin, uh, so, uh, this is something that we have not taken lightly. Uh, making the recommendation that Splash be closed. We're based on uh, CDC regulations, uh, for the public health department regulations, and the government's executive order. And he has maintained that the water parks will not be open, specifically wave pools and, and uh, apparatus that cannot be safely social distance. The lazy river cannot be social distance on that, that function. In addition to that, the regulations call for uh, limiting the number of people that can be in a facility for gatherings. Uh, we participated in many webinars on uh, aquatic facilities as well as the uh, listening to the government's speeches. We found out that every life preserver that would be used when it was taken off it would have to be sanitized before anybody else could touch it. On any life rafts or tubes that were used on Lacey River, before anybody else could touch it, it had to be sanitized. Anybody was going along in Lacey River and putting their hands up on the rail, on the sides, that area would have to be sanitized. If somebody gets up out of a chair and does not leave a towel on it, come back to it, it has to be sanitized before anybody else can go on that, that particular uh, chair or, or any of the other apparatus. Social distancing has to be provided uh, throughout uh, for the participants. And it's recommended, but it's not mandatory, that people that are not in the water wear a face mask. some regulations uh, or, or talk about and, and it is in the uh, swimming pool category that staff including the lifeguards have to wear uh, face masks. But looking at all that and the fact that we haven't hired staff, the availability of staff with a lot of them leaving town earliest date that we thought that we probably could open would be July 1st and then uh, on a limited basis. Capacity I believe just was 4,000? 4,400. 4, well 25% of that's all we could do. We talked about using uh, uh, split sessions and sanitizing the whole facility in between those sessions. It's really not feasible to do that. Uh, based on, the, on all those and the cost factor of what, what it would cost to open the facility, run the facility, 
and the reduction in income, it's really not feasible to, to open it this year. It, it wasn't taken lightly. We, we work as a committee, staff, uh, slash staff work diligently on it in, in communication with me. I look at regulations. And that was our recommendation that, that, that uh, this year that it would be pretty difficult to, to operate a successful venue that was safe for people to use. Justin, you want to get some comments and some of the other comments? Yes, sir. Um, good evening, Chairman, Commissioners. Um, some of the rough numbers we put together when analyzing the decision to, to open or remain closed were um, um, the anticipated expenses if we open July 1st would roughly be uh, $85,000 a week. Um, based on previous numbers, um, if we reduce the capacity to 25%, the uh, income we would have for this season would be just over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which broke down to roughly twenty two thousand dollars a week um, in revenue. So we're already digging a hole of, of roughly fifty to sixty thousand per week um, if we were to choose to operate. Um, you know one of the major expenses of Splash and Burrows is staff costs. Uh, even with the reduced um, capacity of 25 percent uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we get to reduce staff uh, no matter if there's 50 people inside the water park or 5,000 people in the water park our lifeguard and slide attendants um, those numbers have to remain the same they're not guarding based on a number of people they're guarding based on an area of water um, or an area of an attraction um, so those staff numbers would have to remain the same no matter how many people are part. Uh, the other areas of staff that you would think could typically be reduced, such as guest services and maintenance, um, based on a limited capacity, uh, the extra sanitizing and crowd control and trying to manage and enforce social distancing, <coughs> that would have more or less required the same amount of staff. So across the board, we weren't looking at reducing any staff expenses. Uh, so I think that along with just some of the day-to-day the -day routine maintenance and, and sanitization of the rides and all areas within the park, um, maybe we just to manage that aspect of the water park. Um, like I said, per uh, Governor Kemp's executive order, it, specifically spells out wave pool and any other attractions that you can't uh, effectively manage social distancing should not be open. Um, the wave pool, the lazy river, uh, spots had the most key play structures we felt would fall into that category. Uh, some of the slides would be a lot easier to manage. Uh, however, that's just a small portion of what splash and burn offers. So with all that in mind, you know, we, we thought it was in the best interest to keep the water park closed for this summer. Thank you. One other um, caveat in there is that every patron that comes in, and, and I, I, I thought they had deleted this, but every patron that comes in has to be monitored, has to gather information, and you have to take that temperature, either with a thermal thermometer or a thermal camera. That's going to delay your process of getting in. All ticketing, uh, no cash. All ticketing has to be electronically with a, a designated time that they can come in. So we, we can do that, but you know, it's, it, it, it gets to a point that it, it's not it, it's not safe for people to do that. Anyone knows, and I said it in the meeting a couple of Fridays ago. When you go in the swimming pool. And get in the water, first thing you're going to do is shake your head and body fluids are going everywhere. So that's a, a method for 
strange thing, and all those things were taken into consideration. Is, is the reason that it, it was recommended that you did it. Unfortunately, this question on the the open issue. Any commissioners have any questions or comments? I know this is a well thought out decision. In fact, it was probably one of the hardest appeals that we've had to <coughs> in a long time. But with the facility that we've got out there and going out there and seeing it vacant. But we know it was the right decision and we'll look forward to 2021 when we can start afresh again and hopefully um, all this to be behind us. And so uh, we appreciate all the time and effort that y'all put into studying it out and i guess the social distancing would have, would have been the big thing because um and sanitizing. and sanitizing i don't really know if a lot of people are paying any attention to social distancing anyway but uh i think that area would have been an ideal place to have, have caught this and but we certainly appreciate the decision that y'all made and i thank y'all for coming it was, it was not very easy. No, no, it, it was tough, I know. Next, we have three items on the consent agenda. We have approval of the minutes of May the 12th, approval of the minutes of May the 19th, and alcohol license for jet foods on Highway 80. We can single either one, any of these out and put them under new business, or if you would like to approve them collectively, we can certainly do that. Mr. Chairman, I think we can approve them collectively if, that's, uh, if there's no objection. Second that motion. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? All those in favor, show of hands. Unanimous approval. We have four items under new business and First item is um, road restriping for fiscal year 20. Frank Deal, County Engineer. Uh, this project includes uh, restriping, uh, installing some raised pavement markers, installing rumble strips, and replacing some faded road signs on approximately 32 miles of county roads. Uh, the list of roads includes Jones Mill Road, Old Register Way, Black Creek Church Road, GW Oliver Road, GW Oliver Spur, Excelsior Road, Mud Road, Banks Dairy Road, Ben Grady Collins Road, Mill Creek Road, Eldora Road, Neville's Daisy Road, Cowboy Way, Isaac Aikens, Devils Creek Church Road, Cypress Lake Road, at least apart from the bypass to the Sageboro city limits. <coughs> uh, we're also doing a little bit of work on uh, Country Club Road, Lanier Drive, and also Portal Metter Highway, and there's a portion of Portal Metter Highway inside the city of Portal that we're looking to possibly do it. The city of Portal is looking to reimburse us and teach lost money to kind of go in with us on that. So, the low bid on the project was from Mid-State Construction and Striking in the amount of $169,703.65. Our budget for the project was $160,000, but after some discussion with staff, um, we feel we have enough teach loss money to go ahead and do the whole thing. It goes about $9,000 over our original budget. And so I'm recommending approval of this contract and just let me know if you have any questions. Do you have any questions or comments? Then I'll ask for a motion. We can approve, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. I have a motion, second. Any more discussion? All those in favor of the motion, show hands. Unanimous approval. Bill, I think you're going to do this one also. It's uh, Miller Street Extension Colfax Station project. Yes, sir. And uh, you may recall that we started with uh, public works kind of beginning this project 
which is the pavement of Miller Street extension from Friendship Church Road to Colfax Station, and then all of Colfax Station. So it's a distance of a little over a mile. Um, Public Works did some, some clearing out there and then pulled off due to you know, a lot of maintenance issues that were going on in other parts of the county. So EMC Engineering did a design, put together some bid, bid specifications for the project, and we received sealed bids on uh, May the 14th. And so this project is going to include some some grading, kind of picking up where Public Works left off and installing uh, some storm drain pipe and then putting in the road base and, and then, of course, paving the road. Uh, the low bid that we got was from Ellis Wood Construction in the amount of $457,162.35. Uh, when we were reviewing the bids, we did run into an issue with the apparent second lowest bid, which was from Bill Creek Construction. Uh, we noticed they had some errors in, on their bid sheet, and it was a little unclear as to what the actual bid amount was going to be, but after discussing with Jeff and uh, county staff, we decided that we would go with the, the total bid that was put at the bottom of the bid sheet to determine who was the low bid, which was Ellis Wood Construction. And Ellis Wood didn't have any mistakes or errors on their, their bid submittal, so and met all the uh, requirements of the dispatch. Uh, the budgeted amount for this project was set back when Public Works was going to do all of the grading and, and base. And so the budget was $332,900. And so we knew when we decided to contract out the remainder that it was going to go a little bit over the original the original budget that we had in place. Um, but after you know discussing with staff, we do feel that there is enough piece loss money there available to get this project off the ground and get it moved. If we had to push back something later on, you know, that's a possibility, but there was enough funds there to move forward with this project. And EMC's estimate was 624000 So it was just a good bit below that at $457,162.35. So with that, I'm recommending to award this bid to Ellis Wood and so I can help you have any questions. Anyone have any questions? Comments? Not on this for a motion. I move we approve this, Mr. Chairman. Second. A motion to second and more discussion. Hearing none, all of those in favor of the motion show of hands. Unanimous approval. Question before you leave. I know we've got Fid Road that we're going to pay. That they're next, or is the what was the other? Uh, we have High Point Circle, and that's budgeted for this year. And right now, it's, the design is being completed on it. It's not complete yet, but it's under it's being designed right now. Um, so that was really the next one. Hood Road is <coughs> after that. Hood Road is, is budgeted for fiscal year 21. Okay. Um, and, and you know, I still think it was a wise decision that that we get someone to prep the roads and everything, and not our roads department because with 31 and 3 8 inches of rain and a short period of time, all of our dirt roads, you know, required our department to work on them. So I, I think this is what we're going to have to do. In the future, so we don't get so far behind. And so go. So we have High Point Circle second, and then Hood Road will be completed by December 31st, 2021. We'll shoot for that. Uh, no, uh, Hood Road is going to be completed by December 31st, 2021. Right, commissioners? Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's move along now. We really appreciate the. <laughs> Next, we have the revenue bonds to be issued by the Development Authority for Georgia Southern University Housing Foundation, 7 LLC. Jeff, you will do this one. Uh, yes, sir. Well, Mr. Steve Rushing is here. He's going to present this. But as he makes his way up to the podium, I will just make one point that I think is important, and that's the approval that they're asking you for is simply has to do with the tax exempt status of the bonds. It's a IRS uh, regulation. And 
the county will not have any obligation at all on the uh, debt represented by these bonds. So I think that's important to emphasize. And we, we've done this several times in the past. Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, yes, I'm Steve Rushing. I'm an attorney here in Statesboro. Uh, but I'm actually here tonight as the appointed hearing officer uh, by the Development Party of Bullock County, who has received an application from Georgia Southern University Housing Foundation 7 LLC, which is a new entity formed by the Georgia Southern uh, Housing Foundation. Uh, it seems that uh, a student housing facility named uh, Kennedy Hall uh, was discovered to have some major issues uh, um, that could uh, harm the safety of the students there. Uh, so they are having to fully renovate and improve um, Kennedy Hall on their campus. Uh, their finance folks uh, have determined that it could be accomplished through tax-exempt bonds issued by the Development Authority of Bullock County. Uh, so it made such an application. The Development Authority met and uh, adopted a resolution uh, to approve the application and to uh, issue its bonds for um, an amount not to exceed $20 million. Um, those bonds would be sold to an underwriter to the general public um, and the proceeds that would be received from selling those bonds would be loaned to this entity for the purposes of um, uh, repairing and renovating uh, Kennedy Hall and for paying the costs of the financing. Um, and uh, Jeff is correct, uh, as part of that process, um, the tax exempt aspect of the bonds requires under section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code uh, that the project be approved by the, uh, the high selected officer uh, of the jurisdiction in which uh, the development authority appears, and that would be, uh, Mr. Chairman, that would be your position as the chairman of the board of commissioners. Uh, so we, um, under the rules, before we could present this to you, we were required to give the public an opportunity to be heard on this matter. And so uh, we ran a notice in the states for a herald um, twice, once on uh, May the 7th and once on May the 14th, uh, regarding uh, an opportunity to be heard on this matter. I uh, have the State for Herald affidavit of publication that that did occur. And then on May the 22nd, at 10 o'clock a.m. Mm -hmm. at the offices of the Chamber of Commerce, we opened uh, an opportunity to be heard. And during this time of COVID that we've all been dealing with, uh, we reached out to uh, uh, the authorities in that regard and determined that uh, such a hearing could also be um, participated through telephone or teleconference uh, without having to be physically present. So we uh, made that available. We also included that in our notice in the newspaper, uh, the telephone number that anyone could call in on. And so uh, we appeared on that day. And of course, uh, with all that being spelled out in the notice, no one had any opposition uh, to that, so we were then required to deliver our, our certificate of that hearing uh, to this commission, and uh, that there was no objections in that regard. And, I'm sorry, and then we, uh, uh, we are required to obtain uh, from uh, this commission signed by the chairman uh, a certificate that this commission, uh, this uh, authority, uh, approves the issuance of these bonds for this purpose for use by Georgia Southern University. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll direct those to Jeff Akins, but I'll try, <laughs> try to answer any others you may have. But uh, we just need your approval and um, Georgia Southern um, to it so that their application be granted. I might add that in addition to this part, which is the tax exempt part, um, all bonds issued by the Development Authority must also be validated by the Superior Court of Bullock County after uh, also notice to be heard in that regard. And that was also run during the month of May. And uh, a hearing was conducted by Judge Muldrew in Bullock Superior Court. Again, there were no objections 
Uh, the rest of these bonds have already been validated in that regard and signed by all the uh, Superior Court judges. So all we need at this point is this uh, approval of this commission and a signature uh, by its chair. Okay. Have any questions? Then I'll ask for a motion. What's the motion we approve the issue of the bonds? Yes, a motion. Sorry. A motion. We have a second. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, show of hands. Unanimous approval. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you be in a position to be able to sign this tonight? Uh, or shall I leave that for Jim? Mm -hmm. I'll bring it to you. I was going to suggest that before Christmas. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a duplicate. So there's two places for you to sign the same form certificate. That's not what y'all just did. Not that I anticipated that, but we didn't prepare anything. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Bill Tyson, the uh, Bullock County Cooperative Extension Director, contacted me a few months ago indicating that uh, the Extension Service Yard in Athens at the University of Georgia is trying to document, update, and make more uniform all of their memorandums of understandings for each county. And these MOUs typically concern operational and compensation matters. And the main focus that I want to introduce this evening is uh, merely picking an option for the transactional method of compensation that we use. And if you'll uh, indulge me, I'll try to be very brief in uh, trying to explain this because I'm not sure to the layperson if these contracts are, are easy to understand. Uh, in the MOU, there are three options, A, B, and C. And across uh, Georgia's 159 counties, extension personnel are paid in one of three ways. And every county does it differently in any of the combinations. Here in Bullock County, we've uh, done this among the extension personnel in all three ways. In option way A, which is called cooperative direct pay, uh, we have four full-time extension employees, and they receive uh, salary and benefits from the University of Georgia, and they're also given um, a county supplement uh, in addition to their UGA salary. In option B, it's called cooperative contract pay. There is one full-time employee, um, and uh, they also get pay, supplement, and benefits but in this particular transaction, uh, in the past, we sort of signed an administrative memo saying that we agree just to send them money, uh, unlike the other four folks where we just, well, we actually send checks to UGA and we pay the county supplement out of our own payroll. In the case of cooperative contract pay, we I think we uh, strictly cut one check a month or maybe it's an ACH transaction to the University of Georgia for that employee. And under option C, which is called county funded extension personnel, there's actually one part-time employee, but that comes, to, uh, those transactions for pay come directly through the county payroll and that particular employee does not have any benefits. Now, when you uh, look across all of the transactions for for payroll and or benefits that are provided. Uh, with option A, I believe uh, we, we probably do 
among those four employees, 104 direct deposit transactions for the county supplement, and then there's 12 transactions, one per month with UGA. For the one employee who's under uh, option D, uh, those are typically 12 transactions to UGA. And in option C, since the county funded extension personnel is under county payroll and we pay bi-weekly, that's typically 26 direct deposit transactions. So what we're trying to do, and I've, I've spoken to the uh, extension director and I think they're in agreement with this, and we were given the option, or we were given the opportunity to select among the three options, uh, we would uh, recommend that you all approve this MOU with option B. And the purpose is, is to uh, streamline the county's existing administrative bur burden by going with co cooperative contract pay. And in this arrangement, the existing extension employees are not losing any pay or benefits or, or supplements through UGA or the county. What we're doing is hoping to just reduce the annual transactions from 164 transactions that are sort of scattered between the city and the county. And basically, whether it's through an ACA or ACH transaction or a chat, just want do one transaction a month with UGA and let all of those employees be handled under that payroll. And in this arrangement, even though we like to consider the cooperative extension part of the county family, and they still are fundamentally and, and morally and, and emotionally, uh, if, if you look at the structure of the contract out of any of those three options, all of their uh, you know, managerial responsibilities, employee and operational responsibilities, are to the primary employer, which is the University of Georgia. So again, to make a long story short, and forgive me for walking, walking through all that, but I think it was about a six page memorandum and I was just taking a few minutes to cut, cut to the chase. But we're really trying to reduce uh, the number of financial transactions from 164 to 12. So I think everybody's on board and we recommend that we approve the the MOU with the selection of option B. Okay. I'm certainly glad you simplified that for us. Do we have any do we have any questions? I make a motion that we approve uh, this with option B. And second the motion. Have a motion, second, and more discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, show of hands. Unanimous approval. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Tom, the workshop, how long will it last? Well, to be honest with you, I don't think it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be more of an update than a workshop. Um, I think with uh, Mr. Welch's consent, who's been working uh, fervently on uh, a lot of the minutia. You know, we, I, I, I'll just kind of open it up on where I think you told me we're at, and then you can either fill in the blanks or correct me. How's that? Uh, we're still working on the general fund, uh, trying to make uh, some final adjustments pursuant to what we've discussed in uh, previous workshops. And I think the uh, only major uh, factor or variable that we're waiting on right now, uh, just prior to this meeting, open enrollment for health insurance uh, for our full-time employees uh, concluded. So I think uh, HR working with payroll and finance and uh, obviously Mr. Welch, they're, they're going to compile the data and see what kind of uh, shifts, because if, as you know, with employees in open enrollment, we've got four different health plans. All of them come with a different degree of expense. And so we have to uh, evaluate any changes that were made. I don't think we're expecting any major changes, but uh, we still have to get all the data in, and we think that may take through the end of the week to kind of plug in the budget. Is that right? That's right. And um, we're still evaluating uh, 
spots from T spots, and we've been trading some emails uh, from myself, Mr. Welch, and Miss Richmond. And I, I think we're still stuck in our original premise that we believe SPLOS and T-SPLOS revenues are likely to uh, dip 10 to 15 percent next year. Uh, we're seeing some very strange state economic data. Uh, some of you may or may not know the recent Bullock County unemployment rate came out at 11.4 percent, which was above 5.3 percent uh, last month. Frankly, it's better than some of our neighboring counties. Uh, Glenn and Chatham are, have been hit pretty hard. They're up in the 16, 17% range. But then we've got a few of our less populated neighbors to the east and the south that are still below 10. Uh, but our sale, the sales tax data that came in was surprising. It was more than it was in March but it was just a little bit below what it was of April, uh, from April of last year. Now that is good news, but we, we think that what will probably happen is uh, those unemployment and sales tax lines will cross because uh, if the unemployment rate doesn't go down or hopefully at least it doesn't go up uh, to a great degree, you know, those lines are gonna intersect and we, we would still foresee sales tax going down. I know the school board has projected a higher rate of loss, but um, they're probably taking as much of a guess as we are. And then I think like we spoke at the last meeting, I, I believe uh, most of our special revenue teams, you know, we've, they're under, they're, I don't think they're gonna foresee any uh, severe issues this year. And those are the major ones like 911 and uh, the airport. Of course, we, we kind of know we've got a deal uh, with the uh, splash, in, oops, splash in the borough debt payment. And that's uh, what's going to take some a little uh, additional time uh, to contemplate how to pay for that. We were hoping uh, of one particular way to pay for it that I won't digress into, but the county attorney disappointed us. So, uh, but to the good, to the good. He's just trying to keep us in the lane, uh, or our lane. So I think this evening, uh, unless Mr. Welch wants to re report something more specific, uh, I, I think we're at a point where we're still trying to sharpen our saw. And if you remember in the uh, early May workshop, uh, we predicted that um, we were probably gonna have to have our public hearing in adoption uh, later in the month, probably during the last couple weeks and off schedule from our regular meeting. We're gonna try to accelerate that as much as, as we can, but I, I think we, we wanna make sure that we're very secure in our numbers before we present the tentative budget um, either to you or, or the public. Maybe we would submit that tentative budget by the 16th, is that correct? Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, we hope we don't have to go to the last day of June to get it approved, but uh, maybe Andy might have a better forecast of uh, what the budget calendar may look like. I think what we submitted before, I think you, you gave an updated calendar, Tom. I think we're still good on that calendar right now, though. The one other thing I'll mention that we wanted to get some more numbers on was to get with the tax commissioner, or tax assessor. That's right. One last time to make sure their latest and greatest numbers are what we're using in the budget. So we're waiting to get with them, I think later this week or early next week to make sure we have the, the best revenue numbers that we have on taxes. And I do want to reemphasize, uh, and I think it was in the work, uh, either it was in one of the workshops or discussions in May, you remember there are uh, four different scenarios that we were looking at. You know, we're cautiously optimistic we may be able to look at the most hopeful scenario, but in the event there's a second wave of a, of a pandemic or, you know, there, the economic damage is worse than we thought or there's economic damage possibly created by another wave of the pandemic. I don't think we, we need to throw those uh, other less favorable scenarios out the window. We will 
that's the other thing that, that I think we have to do with our budget strategy. You, you remember I talked that uh, we had to be nimble and adapt in case uh, economic indicators were worse or revenue wasn't coming in as we had hoped. And I think in terms of strategy, we, we want to at least make a presentation of what we need to do in the event that uh, the picture isn't as rosy as we hope. And when I say it's rosy, it's not rosy because we know we've already determined we're going to have a significant deficit uh, next uh, next fiscal year that we're going to have to use fund balance in addition to this year's deficit. So, um, but I, I think I can say with confidence we're, we're very close to tying things up. But uh, I think it's important when we go forward to talk as much about the numbers as it is the strategic aspect of what to do, uh, depending upon how things go on through the fiscal year with the pandemic or up the, uh, the rest of the external environment. And uh, unless you have anything to add, Andy, Andy I, I'm done. <coughs> uh, unless you all have any questions or comments or anything. Anybody have any questions? We'll move on. Thank you for that report. Um, next will be comments. We have any staff comments? Commissioner comments? Mr. Chairman, I would, I'd like to ask Mr. Mr. Buck, I mean, this folks this afternoon, just to kind of bring the commissioners and the staff up to up the car on the, now this is the horizontal mode, not the vertical mode, that big stuff. So if anybody's running anybody on the street, you'd be able to answer the questions and stuff. Not know that. So, okay. Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rickett. Um, just, I guess, some additional information. Our normal mowing contract for roadside mowing starts uh, 1st of April, and the first round should end by the end of May. Um, and then the second one will start up mid-June and, and end up uh, mid-August. The, because of the COVID, the contractor had a late start this year. And uh, so he is running behind. You may see some roads that have been cut. You may know some roads that haven't. And they should have been completed by now. Uh, but in discussion with him and consideration for his situation with COVID-19, he has assured us that there will be no delay in between the first round of cutting and the second. He to be a poll worker for the election next week along with I think 22 or 23 other county employees who who also volunteered. And um, we all love our election superintendent, as we know. But I, I just wanna say, number one, I after today and the training that, that was given, I have a greater appreciation for what poll workers have to do. But further than that, uh, with uh, the tumult with the pandemic, the new voting machines, and everything else that goes into it. I also want to thank the other other employees for stepping up and volunteering uh, for working on election day. And um, it was an eye opener for me when, not only when, when you think about what they have to do regularly, but um, with the new voting machines, I know maybe for a regular voter, or a regular citizen, there there might be it might be a little bit of a challenge in consideration of what they were accustomed to. But um, I I really gotta give my hats off to the elections and voter registration department. Absentee ballots that they have to count, the paper ballots that they have to secure. I mean I Maybe I want to use this as an opportunity that we, we need to make sure to thank them after the election season's over, if not before. Thank you. Yes, sir. And they do have a tough job. Anyone else? Commissioners? Anyone else? You know, my best mentor every morning reminds me of something this too shall pass and it will eventually um, so she keeps me upbeat at least when i'm getting to my truck 
and it's all down, <laughs> it's down, down the hill, I suppose. No, it's, it's still the greatest county and the greatest employees of anybody anywhere in any state, in any county. So I would like to say thank you. Um, we're going to close to, to adjourn into executive session, but I must make up and read this statement according to ACCG Code 42, 10, 11, 14, 16, 18, 21, ACZ, and Code 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 11, BDE. We will now, I'll ask now for a motion to close and go into executive session for personnel matters. So moved. Motion second. Second. We will now close and move into executive session. And so thank you all for coming.